Welcome back to episode 12 of Take 5 Fridays, where we talk the people and process behind making and maintaining the U.S. diplomatic presence around the world. This week, we're joined by OBO's Director of Architecture, Curtis Clay, in conversation with James Timberlake, architect and partner at Kieran Timberlake. Founded in 1984, Kieran Timberlake brings together the experience and talents of over 100 professionals of diverse backgrounds and abilities in a practice that is recognized worldwide. Their projects include programming, planning, and design of new buildings, as well as the conversation, renovation, and transformation of existing buildings with special expertise in education, government, arts and culture, civic, and residential projects. James is a founding partner and has worked on many innovative projects that emphasize efficient construction methods, resource conservation strategies, and the novel use of building materials. Under his guidance, the firm has received over 200 design citations, including the AIA Firm Award in 2008 and the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award in 2010. Their collaboration with the Department of State includes work on the new state-of-the-art U.S. Embassy in London. Curtis Clay is a licensed architect in Virginia and the District of Columbia and supervises all phases of architectural design and construction at the department. He has over 20 years of experience in the design and construction industry, including government, commercial, institutional, and private work. We're glad to have both of them with us today. Thank you for joining us. Hey, James. Curtis, good to be with you. Thank you for having me. How are you, sir? Doing well. Rainy day up here in in Philadelphia. Yeah, same here. You see we our nice OBO background. The London uh, Embassy is one of our illustrious backgrounds that we used for the I, whole department. So I, thank I you for that. that. I love that. I need to get a copy of that. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to start with, um, you know, when I look at the work of your firm, uh, I, I've always been intrigued by this commitment to research alongside um, these sustainability principles and the contemporary expressions of clean lines that the firm does. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, was there a point where you decided um, you wanted to have this firm that continuously conducted research as an integral part of your practice? That's a great question. You know, that probably goes back to when both Steve and Kieran and I were in graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania and, you know, uh, learned at the feet of, you know, architects like Robert Venturi, uh, and Denise Scott Brown, Stephen Eisenhower, so many others who both Steve and I ended up going to work for. And back in the day, I think Venturi, Rock and Scott Brown would have been considered you know, a kind of research firm. I mean, they wrote Learning from Las Vegas. They wrote Absolutely. so many books, you know, that both fed the uh, academy and the, the academic world, but also fed the profession as well. And I think mentoring there really instilled in us the need to have research as a critical piece of our oeuvre our, of work. Uh, and so when we began the practice in 1984, S Steve and I and some members of the firm, you know, really began to take that on. I think it was really around the year 2000 when the College of Fellows of the AIA offered us the opportunity to win the um, first uh, Latrobe Fellowship from the College of Fellows, right, which right. we were the first recipients of. And out of that came books like Refabricating Architecture, uh, you know, finding new materials like working on smart wrap for the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum back in the day that ended up on Cellophane House in 2008. And then of course, informed the ETFE outer wrap of, of the uh, new London embassy as well. So that, research culture has been a piece of us for probably over 40 years. And I think it's been the last 20 years where we've really also doubled down by reinvesting in that in the firm here with a transdisciplinary team of researchers that cover the gamut from sustainability and environmental ethics to 
um, looking at new ways of, of uh, new softwares, new um, ways of practice and working, uh, offsite construction and other kinds of things like that. And it's, it's clear the, the way you approach um, solving problems for OBO, that that is an integral part of your thinking. And I'm, I know that's part of the reason why we, uh, OBO was attracted to your work in the first place. Um, how did you become interested in working with the State Department? Gosh, you know, that goes back also some time, but I think the, the um, you know, as a young architect, seeing the work that Saarinen did in London in 1960, seeing the work in, in this subcontinent Asia or South America that was, you know, so much a, a, a mission of, of the Department of State and OBO um, as a means of projecting arts and culture and craft, you know, to the world. Um, you know, such an underpinning of diplomacy really as architecture and art and culture really was something of real intrigue to us. And the question was, how do you get in? You know, how do you, how do you get, how do you become attractive enough to you guys and gals at OBO and the Department of State? And I think, you know, over the years of building a practice, you know, um, you know, sustainability and environmental ethics has always been a critical piece of our work. When, when the new London embassy was um, being vetted essentially as an opportunity for a contract back in 2008, we had a call from, um, uh, you know, a, a good colleague and friend, landscape architect who, um, um, uh, you know, just simply thought that we should submit our qualifications for that. And we thought we were a real outlier. And, you know, when we, we were one of the youngest firms, I think, submitting um, back in 2008, 2009, but the qualifications certainly added up to being able to um, do the work uh, and doing work of scale. And, um, and of course, we ended up as one of the four firms, you know, selected to do the competition. And that led to the new London, London Embassy win. And then after that, obviously, uh, being interested in doing more work with, with all of you, uh, applying for an IDIQ. And that's been a really wonderful, you know, uh, a bit of work over the last couple of years, and most recently working directly with you as well. Did you have any idea the the impact that that building would have on that neighborhood. You know, one of the things that we we talk about and we're structuring ideas around is this idea of the embassy effect where, you know, where we plant the American flag, not only the political and social impact, but the economic impact that these buildings have on communities, even in a major metropolitan area like London. I mean, did you have any idea of the kind of impact that the building was gonna have on that neighborhood in London when you first conceived of the project? You know, you never know the entirety of that impact. I think you can anticipate the impact. And certainly uh, the folks that did the pre-planning like ZGF and um, obviously uh, um, working with Jerry and, and so many other, uh, uh, Steve Davies um, working with, uh, you know, so many others at OBO on this particular uh, 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 project, all of those kinds of things came up and they, they pushed us. I mean, I, they, we didn't really need to be pushed, but I think they pushed us to really um, not only understand that impact, but also look, um, uh, well, we were interested in looking beyond the boundaries. They encouraged us to look beyond the boundaries of, of the impact as well. And I think, um, you know, you have a sense of history when you're doing a project like this. So knowing the impact that, that uh, Saarinen had had on Grosvenor Square back in 1960 and how that transformed that neighborhood certainly was an inkling of how and Mayfair, how Mayfair changed, was certainly an inkling of how Wandsworth and 
nine elms might might change, you know, with the impact of a building of that stature. Then it became a question of, well, what is it, you know, um, because there's really no context there. And how do you, how do you both, how can it be of the context, but in the context at the same time that it's really helping to define a context? You know, that's a pretty complex conversation to have as an architect. And, um, uh, you know, I think the, uh, th those continue to be complex conversations, not only throughout the con conversation of the, of, the, of the competition, but post competition as we were doing the schematic design, the design development, uh, you know, going forward, because it, it, it really then influenced, I think, a lot of the rest of the neighborhood and how, how a lot of that rest of that neighborhood is turning out. Um, it upped that game as well, I think. Yeah. And, you know, context is one of those important issues we, we always wrestle with with architects globally. Um, you're currently designing our new consulate in Curacao. Um, and it's one of those problems that we talk a lot to with our architects is how to do something that's distinctly American um, while being culturally contextual, yet not culturally appropriating. Um, and we have this issue whether we're working in Africa, Asia, or you know, near a UNESCO World Heritage Site in Curacao. So I'm wondering how, how you, your thinking and approach is about trying to do something that's inherently American, um, yet still being culturally contextual. You know, that is a that is a a one of the things that makes your work really truly rich for all architects is that is embracing that, you know, that question. Um, and, you know, you take Curacao, for instance, up on a hill on a prospect with a, uh, an existing uh, historic complex of, you know, the Consulate, Ge uh, Consulate General's residence um, and a series of outbuildings, but up on the prospect of, above uh, the city and, yet next to a highway and not a lot of other buildings are gonna get built around it. So it's gonna remain pretty exposed for a long period of time. How to, how to wrestle with having that engage the landscape, um, be of the landscape, but um, be prominent enough without standing out as a, as a kind of arrogant, you know, uh, outlier to that really rich historical con uh, uh, um, uh, architectural context of the city, which is highly colored, uh, multivariant colors, rich Dutch influences, peaks and valleys of roofs and gables, um, stucco, punched windows, uh, you know, uh, uh, and something that the Curacaoans really embrace as, as part of their cultural heritage and an attraction, you know, that everybody comes for. So nobody, including the United States of America and OBO and Department of State, wants a complex up on that, up on that hill that then becomes this kind of cool outlier to all of that. So trying to, trying to wrestle with that, we embrace the idea that this building could potentially be one of the few buildings that OBO does that has actually color, explicit color. But looking for what subtle ways to do that, um, you know, I think has been really intriguing and an intriguing conversation with you and and Frank and so many others. The the um, uh, you know you want to respect the CGR, but that's of a era in a in a, an architecture that the main building can't be of. And so we've sort of set up a contrasting language, I think, that allows both to coexist uh, together um, carefully uh, and, and uh, intrinsically uh, without one overwhelming the other. Yeah, well, I look forward to sharing that uh, building with everyone. Yeah, uh, it's an great. exciting building, yeah. My last question uh, for you, uh, what have been some of the biggest sources of inspiration uh, for you in your career thus far? Well, gosh, you know, um, uh, you know, there, there, there are lots of different things that go all the way back to wanting to be an architect ever since I was five, you know? So 
Uh, there have been uh, lots of different things that have obviously in interested me. I think one of the great things about working with the Department of State and OBO is just is is the whole in, in returning to that first question about diplomacy, you know, and how architecture is both, you know, you 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 create an architecture of diplomacy and a diplomacy of you know the architecture. Uh, and, and I just simply think that one of the things that intrigues me is what all of the people at the Department of State do as ambassadors of the United States of America, working with other nations and working in other cultures and how they negotiate on a daily basis, you know, that conversation and that handshake in the places that they are in the disparate corners of the globe. And frankly, if I wasn't an architect, I'd love to be an ambassador, you know, to be really truly yeah. honest with you. Uh, it just seems like a job that would be so much fun and of great interest uh, to me. But putting that aside, you know, there have been lots of influences, like you would know from being in architecture school, going back to Frank Lloyd Wright and, and Le Corbusier and people like that, but going through Penn, you know, uh, there are architects like Louis Kahn who did the um, Capitol building in, uh, in, um, in Dhaka, which I've now been to eight times uh, and just find an incredible so rich source of influence in terms of both having an appreciation of how a building sets itself up as uh, speaking for a people, representing a government, um, but also being uh, both present and in a context. And th those, those things are really, really daily conversations that I think an architect goes through as they're making these kinds of buildings, uh, no matter where we go in the world. Um, and uh, it, and, it, and that's what makes these projects fun, you know, and, 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 and a great conversation to have with the people on the other side of the table who we're working with is the project team. Well, I appreciate that, James. And you mentioned a number of the modern masters, and I often say you can track the history of American architecture through Obigo's portfolio, whether it's Gropius, Brewer, I am Pei, and very happy to have uh, a number of your buildings added to that legacy. So thank you very much for your time today. We appreciate that. And my best to everybody at OBO and the Department of State. Thanks for having me. Join us next week where we welcome Virginia Price from our Office of Cultural Heritage and Ted Grevstad Nordbrook, Historic Preservation Professor with the Department of Community and Regional Planning at Iowa State University. See you next week.